Yeah, this is a very exciting area. I think we're going to see a lot more of uh, this uh, topic now. It's, uh, it's an evolving uh, frontier. Um, historically, we've actually been afraid of vascular structures. Uh, we're taught uh, to use Doppler when we do endoscopic ultrasound to identify vessels that we want to avoid when we do our FNA. Uh, now, we're intentionally targeting uh, vessels and applying therapy. So it, it is a change in our mindset. Um, it, it's really a natural evolution of uh, FNA, something that we're all very comfortable with and we perform uh, routinely in our practice. Uh, we're just switching out the A for an I now. So instead of aspirating, we're doing the reverse. Uh, we're injecting or we're implanting. So we could inject a solution. It could be a sclerosant. It could be cyanoacrylate glue. And it could be uh, a device, uh, a, a coil. Uh, for that matter, when we place a wire through an FNA needle, uh, that's also a device. The question is, though, what does EOS add to endoscopy-guided intervention? This is actually a question that came up uh, back when we started doing pseudocyst drainage under EOS guidance. A very same question was asked. So what advantage is there to using uh, EOS? You can see the big prominent bulge of the pseudocyst on the gastric wall. Why not just drain this endoscopically? Why, what's the advantage of using EOS? Today, I don't think there's anyone that drains a pseudocyst uh, or a WAN uh, endoscopically. It's all done under EOS guidance. And that's simply because it is, it is more blind when you don't see the structure uh, itself. So when we use EOS, we can detect and we can target that vessel lumen. Um, we're only seeing the surface of that lumen or the impact of that lumen on the surface uh, with endoscopy. But more importantly, we can target the feeder vessel. And this is, uh, of course, a concept that, that, that we've borrowed from our radiologists. It, we can control the delivery uh, of our treatment, and we can confirm the success of our treatment. We can see the obliteration of the vessel. But there's also a practical advantage, and that is that we can treat without endoscopic visualization. And certainly, when we're treating a patient with acute bleeding, where the stomach can be filled with blood, or the patient usually is not NPO before our endoscopy, we can overlook the contents in the bowel, and we can just use ultrasound to guide our treatment. I think this sums it up very nicely, this very short video. You can see this uh, exsanguinating bleed here, torrential bleed. It's where the loom is quickly filled with blood, we see nothing. So we can now switch on our ultrasound and we can target that bleeding uh, varix. Now what about the uh, use of EOS guided treatment on uh, a more uh, elective basis? So this is a, a trial that was published uh, over 10 years ago, uh, a Brazilian group. And they looked at the treatment of esophageal varices and they randomized patients to endoscopic sclerotherapy, which was the mainstream uh, back then, but the authors also wanted to compare apples to apples. So they randomized to sclerotherapy versus EOS-guided sclerotherapy. So to determine what is the advantage if we treat these esophageal varices under EOS guidance. So 50 patients got randomized. Now there wasn't a statistical difference in terms of their outcomes, but you can see from the graphs here from the Kaplan-Meier curves that definitely those who underwent EOS-guided treatment had fewer and later recurrences than those who underwent the conventional uh, treatment, and endoscopy-guided sclerotherapy. But importantly, the authors, the operators were able to see the persistence of collateral vessels, and they found that this correlated with the rebleed rate. So if they could document that on EUS, the collaterals were obliterated, these patients did not have rebleeding. So there was this additional value of being able to determine a stopping point uh, for, for treatment. So this is a patient uh, with the esophageal variceal uh, bleeding, had undergone multiple band ligations, and again presents with active bleeding, as you can see here. So we're not going to do yet another band ligation session. We're going to now switch on the Doppler 
and you can see the varics, the perforator feeder vessel, and you can see the collaterals. So we're gonna target under ultrasound guidance the perforator, so the feeder vessel, if you will. And we will see that the cyanoacrylate, which is very echogenic, we can follow it nicely, it will then fill those collaterals and obliterate the entire network um, uh, of which we only see the surface with endoscopy. So you can see the plug now of cyanoacrylate. The bleeding stopped and the patient had no further bleeding. So what about this uh, concept of targeting the feeder vessel or the perforator vein for gastric varices? And it was uh, Rafael Romero Castro from Seville who first reported on the injection of cyanoacrylate targeting the feeder vessel. So the goal is to block the inflow of uh, the feeder of, of the gastric varices with lesser amounts of cyanoacrylate. Uh, small number of patients, it was really a proof of concept study, but he had great hemostasis and no recurrent bleeding. So this is the first report really of a change in mindset where we're not just going to indiscriminately target any varix, we're going to target the uh, feeder vessel. Now, the rationale for this though, what inspired this was really what we all fear when we do cyanoacrylate injection, which is embolization of the glue. And there have been, there's a long list of, of, uh, of complications from embolization, and there have been a number of deaths. And I myself have experienced serious complications from glue embolization, including a, a death. So um, perhaps we should be thinking about an alternative to using glue to avoid embolization. So the use of coils, which of course the radiologists use routinely, was first reported also by Raphael in a case report with four patients. Used a, a, a mean number of nine coils per patient, so a large number of coils, in fact 22 coils in one patient, but again targeting the perforator uh, uh, vein, a proof of concept uh, study. Here in this video, you can see a bleeding gastric varix. So now instead of doing endoscopic guidance, uh, guided injection of cyanoacrylate or targeting the feeder vessel with EOS guidance using glue, we're just gonna put coils in there. So you can see how this is performed. This is the feeder vessel there that is connecting the collaterals on the outside with the varices on the inside. And we're pushing the coil now, which is also very nicely echogenic, so we can see it beautifully. We're pushing that into the varix. So you can see it unravel inside uh, of the varix. And so we'll place whatever number of coils are necessary to obliterate the, the lumen. Uh, a number of authors from uh, Europe, this is a six-center, uh, multi-center trial in, from, uh, from, from Europe. Now, it is retrospective and non-randomized with historical comparison, but what they did is they compare, compared glue injection, EUS-guided, with coil implantation, EUS-guided, targeting the feeder vessel in uh, both uh, groups. They got CT scans immediately after the treatment. And what they found is when they used glue, they had lung embolization in almost half of the patients, 50%, 47% here. Um, and in those patients where they used a glue, there was no lung embolization. Now, what caught my eye when I read this study was that 18% of the patients that under, had undergone coils as their primary treatment, they ended up needing glue treatment because the coils were not sufficient to obliterate the vessels, 18%. None of those 18% developed lung emboli. So it raised the possibility that maybe the coil before the glue injection could uh, prevent uh, embolization. So a few words about these coils. These are synthetic strands attached to a metal alloy coil body. Um, they come in diameters of two millimeters to 20 millimeters. This is the diameter, so you'll select the coil diameter based on your measurement of the varic size. Um, through a 22 gauge needle, uh, you can uh, place coils that are on a 0.018 inch guide wire. This is up to 10 millimeter diameter size. So if your varix is larger than 10 millimeters, you're going to have to use a 19 gauge needle because the coil is mounted on a 0.035 inch wire. Coil lengths vary from two centimeters to 20 centimeters. 
you pick the length of the wire to, uh, based on the number of coils that you want to, or loops that you want to deploy. So if you have a seven centimeter length coil, that's the standard one that I use, you have 2.2 2 .2 loops. And if you use a 14 centimeter length, you get 4.5 loops. Uh, I just prefer to place two coils with a shorter length because sometimes if the, the length is too long, it can bunch up inside of the FNA needle. This is the insertion technique. We puncture the varix using a standard 19 gauge needle, confirm blood return, flush the needle out with some saline. Um, and then we're going to lure lock the coil introducer onto the FNA needle hub and uh, we will then advance the coil into the FNA needle. Once the coil is in the FNA needle, then we can use our pusher, our stylet, uh, to push that coil through the length of the FNA needle um, and into the varics. So here you can see we're aspirating blood after we've punctured the varics and we're flushing with some saline now and clearing the, the lumen. Uh, that's an important step to uh, just make sure that uh, because uh, the blood is, is sticky. And while we've attached the uh, delivery uh, uh, introducer hub, and we're pushing the coil now using the stylet, we're pushing the coil into the FNA needle. And once that coil is in the FNA needle, we can remove the introducer and then push it through the length of the FNA needle. So it's really quite simple. It's an adaption uh, of what the radiologists uh, use routinely. So as mentioned, uh, I uh, asked uh, about the possibility of a hybrid type of approach, coil before glue. These fibers would serve as a scaffold to retain the glue on site. The coil contributes to varix obliteration, uh, and it will reduce flow in the varix that will also contribute to thrombosis. Here ex vivo, you can see that uh, I uh, in injected the glue in, into a container of blood, uh, and the glue attached fully to the coil here, and there was no residual glue in the container. So it all attached to that, to the fibers on the, uh, the woolly fibers of the coil. This is the technique showing FNA puncture, deployment of the coil, injecting the glue, and this is the appearance after eradication. So this would be before and after. This video uh, shows a, a very impressive case of large IGV-1 gastric varices. Obviously, you could uh, treat these under endoscopic guidance, but with EUS, uh, we can now target the uh, feeder vessel. You can see the coils going in, they unravel. Now we're just going to place one coil. So the idea is not to obliterate this with the coils, but rather it's a scaffold to retain the glue in place. So we follow with injection of the glue. The glue attaches to the woolly fibers. And under ultrasound, we can see if there is embolization of the glue, whether it, it flows away or not. You can see the appearance uh, before um, and after uh, treatment. Uh, so that is the same outcome that you would get with endoscopic guidance, but I think by targeting the feeder vessel, uh, uh, we've uh, uh, reduced, if not eliminated, the risk of glue embolization. These are just some of the uh, long-term results that we recently uh, uh, published with high technical success rates. Our rebleeding rate from gastric varices was uh, 8%. Um, and we did have one case of pulmonary embolism, uh, but that actually occurred a week later after the patient was discharged. And uh, we, we don't think this was actually related to glue embolization because the patient had multiple other comorbidities. But certainly, um, that's, uh, it's possible. And uh, we did include it as an adverse event. So here you can see the overall rebleeding rate, 16%, but 8% from gastric varices. Um, and uh, most of these patients underwent additional EUS-guided treatment. So we can retreat the patient with coil and uh, glue treatment. What was interesting is that uh, of those patients who underwent EUS in their follow-up, so this is to echo the results that I mentioned earlier from the Brazil study, evaluating the obliteration with endoscopic ultrasound of the gastric varices in practically all of the patients who had obliterated varices there was no rebleeding. So this gives you a sense of what the endpoint uh, can be. 
uh, when you've completed your uh, treatment. Obviously, these patients will need continued uh, surveillance since we haven't treated the underlying disease. The same uh, technique uh, we're applying for those patients with large uh, rectal varices. And as you know, these patients don't respond similar to gastric varices uh, as well to a TIPS procedure. So in conclusion, EOS guidance, it has many compelling advantages over endoscopy-guided treatment. Uh, certainly those of us who do EUS routinely uh, are more comfortable being able to see the, uh, the, the, the vessel, our target, and we can target the feeder vessel. EUS-guided coil therapy, using our standard FNA needles, it's uh, definitely feasible and effective, um, but um, uh, it would uh, require many coils uh, if you wanted to use the coils solely for the obliteration. So the hybrid procedure, I think, preserves the best of both, and it theoretically decreases the risk of glue embolization. It's anecdotal, so uh, we, we do need to see more studies, and ideally a randomized trial comparing uh, coil before versus no coil. All these patients must have surveillance, and ideally they should have EUS uh, surveillance. Uh, that will determine the need for additional treatments. Thank you very much.